Hey, Fingerers. Uh, so I haven't had to record one of these in a while because we've been pretty good, but the inevitable goofage returned, and I'm here to apologize for what you're about to listen to. So during all the hustle and bustle of trying to drunkenly record four episodes in one night, I forgot to check if everything was set up correctly before we started this episode, and it wasn't until we were just about done that I realized I had not armed my own track for recording. So I was able to salvage most of my comments from the background of the other two mics, and after some editing you can absolutely hear and understand what I'm saying, but it's definitely not the audio quality we hope and strive for on this podcast. So if my voice sounds noisy and tinny, that's because I was talking into a mic that wasn't actually recording, like a real professional. So I do apologize for that, although to be honest, it's probably what you should expect from a podcast that requires a person operating the recording devices to be inebriated. It's just the inherent danger of drunk podcasting. Um, And if it helps, you can imagine me wiping away like a big number from a dry erase board that says this podcast has been mistake free for blank episodes and then filling in that blank with just a big old zero. Um, And I'm just glad that it was my mic that wasn't armed and not our guest Michael Daigler's because he was fantastic and brought a lot of great insight to this review. And while I haven't had the chance to plug it, make sure you check out his website, michaeldaigler.com, and also our website, howmanyfingerspodcast.com, for more episodes. So thank you for listening, and here's our drunken review of Midnight Special featuring author Michael Daigler. Enjoy. Hi, my name's Joe. And I'm Mike. And you're listening to How Many Fingers Am I Holding Up? The podcast, and this week we'll be reviewing Midnight Special. And no, it's not a porno, trust me, I found out the hard way. Hello and welcome to How Many Fingers Am I Holding Up, featuring two guys getting schwasty and reviewing movies in a weekly podcast form. And thank you to borrowed for riley on Instagram for that suggestion, or uh, Riley Slate, also the author of that Odyssey article that put us number two on their podcast to listen to. So uh, thank you so much for that suggestion, Riley. And uh, if you have any other suggestions, you can hit us up on Facebook, How Many Fingers Podcast, or also on Instagram, like Riley did, How Many Fingers Podcast, or also on Twitter, at HMF Podcast. Let us know how you want us to get drunk or schwasty or whatever the fuck you kids are doing these days. (laughs) (laughs) And um, do you want to introduce the guest, or do you want to do the drink first? Um, Let's introduce the guest. All right. Guests before beer. Guests before beer. (laughs) Uh, so joining us for this episode, we have another first-time guest, uh, Michael Degler. Uh, he's, he's a pretty good fit for uh, our podcast right here, because he does. He writes uh, reviews for independently published books, and he also writes fictions, including... Fictions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're plural, including short stories. Uh, he's had uh, published in a few several online and uh, physical outlets, uh, if you want to remind us where you've had... Uh, your work uh yeah um, sure um i have a a story in the current issue of slice magazine okay which is a brooklyn-based literary magazine that's available in most of the bookstores in brooklyn okay great. Uh, if you're not in new york i think you probably have to order it online and um i have another story in uh the sun magazine which is a pretty um uh, well-respected politics and uh, definitely and literary magazine. Yeah, but I mean, Sun. <laughs> <laughs> the sun mag- <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, Sun is everywhere, though. It's, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, just I mean, lots of things uh, called the Sun and, and right. the Sun itself. Um, right, yeah. But yeah, I have a story uh, coming out in their uh, June issue, I think, which is also uh, print, and I should have a story in the uh, summer. Uh, online issue of uh, the Kenyan Review, so that should be up on their website at some point That's awesome. uh, in the coming months. I feel like you're like what English professors dream of. Like they always <laughs> <They're> students, <laughs> <laughs> like they're always like, oh, like submit like all of your stuff, and then like I know I, I mean I think both of us were English majors, and we we're just lazy people. I did like one round of submissions and never did. It's <laughs> hard. It's hard to. 
Well, yeah, I, you, I mean, you just get rejected so, right. like, completely. Like, I've had, I mean, I've been um, fairly lucky as far as placing things, but I still have, like, a like a 97 or 98% rejection rate right. over the past Did these kind of, like, like all come years. at once? Like, did you feel like you had, like, a breakthrough and they're, they're all coming more often now, or has it been more spread out? Um, Yeah, the last, like, six months, uh, eight months have been, I've definitely um, placed more things. I think it's, you know, it's part of its... Uh, uh, editors kind of getting used to you, you know. So maybe you yeah, submit right. like five things to a place, and then they finally, you know, start start paying attention. But um, so yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's nice to get um, a little bit of uh, validation because writing is such a you know kind of a solitary activity, and right. even if people are reading it, you don't like watch them read it, or and you know most of the people uh, that you interact with haven't read your stuff so it's it's yeah. cool to just kind mm -hmm. of um even if it's somebody you don't know just kind of like um you know an acceptance sort of uh keeps you going for for a little while longer right yeah um i imagine it's nice to have it in physical form to like show someone too because like like you make a movie like you have a movie to show someone but like i know for me because i've written too you like write short stories and they're just on your computer so it's right like it's a that. it's a word file it's not oh, right yeah, yeah yeah it definitely feels like more of a a final product yeah. um yeah which is which is nice right, and they, yeah. they were they were calling them fictions for a while in uh fictions, nice. fictions? <laughs> oh really during, during like the postmodernist era like uh jorge louis borges his short stories always seem to be um listed as fictions it's i think people stop doing it because it sounds a little pretentious but um <laughs> yeah. but I, I really hate the uh the word short story because it, mm -hmm. it's almost like self-deprecating just right. within like a, a, the name of the medium mm -hmm. um and like if you're if you write novels you can call yourself a novelist if you write short stories you can't really call yourself any like a short story writer which right, yeah. sounds good. <laughs> so I, I kind of like i don't know i like the term fictions but i'm, I'm sort of afraid to use it because people will just think i'm like a you know an affectatious you know twit so oh, yeah, right yeah, fiction. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a i write uh short stories <laughs> write me one <laughs> it doesn't work like <laughs> um but we can uh you can find uh all of his stuff at uh, is this correct michaeldegler.com yep and your twitter handle is at michael degler yeah yeah I managed to to grab those how is that spelled uh so I know that is spelled. mike that is michael <laughs> And then D E A G L E R. Yep. That's correct. Dot com. Oh, yeah. So and this week we're drinking Corona Light because it is sync. Oh, it's actually your beer that I'm grabbing. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Grab mine. Uh, yeah, we finally, unlike the. Um, is that, oh. The uh, St. Patrick's Day uh, episode, we had enough forethought to know that this will land on. Uh, the uh, Cinco de Mayo, which America has appropriated into, uh, like Corona, drinking Corona and taking tequila shots. Um, I I don't even. What is the what is the background with Cinco de Mayo? I have literally no idea. Right, it's this how eating tacos and drinking Corona. So we're gonna put some limes. Michael, do you know? Uh, I, <laughs> I know that it, it involves the French in some it, aspect. It was, it's some sort of revolution, it, isn't it? I think it was Mexico, Mexico repelling like a French Napoleonic puppet state. Um, but I'm not, I'm not positive. I don't, I don't think they really celebrate it in Mexico. I think mm -hmm. I've heard that. It seems like it's very much just like Mexican St. Patrick's Day. Right. <laughs> um, trying not to spray this all over my computer. Did you get yours in there, Joe? <laughs> I'm still wedging it in. This is embarrassing. This is one of the moments where we would benefit from having a video for this podcast. Yeah, there is some sort of video feed. Joe's trying to squeeze a very fat lime slice <laughs> into a very thin Corona. This is, a, this is a nightmare. I should have... <laughs> Happy New Year. You know, I got these limes from, like, that uh, Doylestown, um, like, farmer's market down the street. Uh-huh. And they have like these limes that are like this big, so I cut them into quarters, and it's not. Joe's just mad because it don't fit. I'm mad because it, <laughs> it don't fit. Oh boy! But uh, the IMDb description, which is a practice in hurting ourselves, 
um, or just cringing. This one's not that bad. No, this was alright. Uh, the IMDb description of this film is: a father and son go on the run, pursued by the government and a cult drawn to the child's special powers. Something was something's weird with that sentence. Son and run rhyming, maybe. Yeah. I also um, don't include the Lucas character in that. Yeah. Although I guess he's not that important. So I do have some quick Joe notes before we get into it. Joe notes. It's it's time for Joe, Joe notes. notes. All right. So Midnight Special is directed by Jeff Nichols. Uh, Nichols has also directed Shotgun Stories, uh, Take Shelter, and Mud. Uh, and it was just announced uh, this week, the week that we're recording, that his upcoming film, Loving, has been accepted into the Cannes Film Festival of 2016. Loving uh, stars Joel Edgerton, who plays Lucas in Midnight Special, uh, the childhood friend slash state trooper, and in Loving he plays Richard Loving, and his wife, uh, Mildred Loving, uh, are sentenced to prison for being in an interracial relationship because it's 1958 and in Virginia. Uh, surprise, surprise, Michael. Uh, <laughs> surprise surprise michael uh surprise surprise michael shannon is also in it because michael shannon is in every single movie oh, yeah. that nichols directs um and sometimes i'll dismiss this as sort of just lazy casting i really don't like this a lot of the time but it's very obvious that nichols and shannon sort of mesh very well with both of their with all the films that they do it's not like david o russell Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence. This so ongoing I like, orgy. I feel like I like it when I see people collaborate more often because I, I get the feeling that they probably just genuinely enjoy working together. Which I feel like that's got to make for a better movie in the end. Like if you're having fun mm. making the movie work. Well, I don't like David O. Russell and Bradley Cooper and J. Law and like Robert De Niro like jerking off in the corner. Yeah, like it's like, like, like I don't like that. that. Yeah. I think most people tend to enjoy. Have you guys uh, seen any of this? Uh... What's what's the what's the director's name? Um, Jeff, Nichols. Jeff Nichols. Yeah, have you have you seen any of the uh, the other ones that he did? I was able to see Take Shelter, uh, Mud. I've seen a portion of. I was watching it and something distracted me and never finished it on Netflix. Yeah, uh, I really liked it. Did yeah. you, have you seen anything? I did, well, I I saw yeah like about the first half of Shotgun Stories when that was on Netflix. Right, and it was. That seemed um, really. I've watched the trailer for that. That seemed like really slice of Americana kind of. It had. I mean, the premise was really good because I think it's about like two factions of feuding, like half brothers. Right. Um, it's kind of like Hatfield's McCoys kind of ish. But I, yeah, mm-hmm. but it wasn't like smaller. Scale. I guess that was like it. You know, his first movie and, and it was. pretty low budget and mm-hmm. and it it, it they, they you I think you could tell that they were like they weren't doing a lot because of like budget restraints like it was like a lot of driving around in pickup right. trucks and <laughs> yes. i think like i think like a main char- like a, a large character like dies off screen and you're kind of like did they just not like want right. yeah. <laughs> to like maybe the, the the making him look like he was killed was was too much of an effort to uh, right yeah but, my, but michael shannon wasn't that i think he was like the only sort of person that you would you would recognize yeah i think um, was he the protagonist in that or? yeah i think he was like the the main one of the main brothers of the two groups of brothers right it's a very a very fertile guy who uh fathered <laughs> all these birth to all these boys <laughs> seemed to just two gangs of men feuding in this in this town a bunch of pugnacious sons <laughs> but i never saw mud with mud was was mud supposed sons to be good <laughs> yeah uh i remember it did very well at whatever uh film festival it was at well that kind of came out like right as uh like Matthew McConaughey was kind of like he was on the, the up and up. Yeah, was Take Shelter good? Because I remember we saw the trailer for that together a while ago, and we thought it looked really cool. We never oh, to see that it. was like back back. Like I feel like we saw the trailer for Take Shelter at the Montclair Theater in New Jersey while we were waiting for Tree of Life to come on. Oh, you're right. Yeah. So like that kind of really ages it for me. But yes, it was very good. I liked it a lot. Um. I don't know where it, it's very similar to this movie, and I'll definitely talk about that. It's similar to the, the to Midnight Special. Yes, in, thematically. Okay. Uh, it's it's just it's about it has sort of this mystic sort of atmosphere 
that blends together with the you know everyday life and it's also about a man michael shannon who's kind of trying to protect his family at all cost mm-hmm. uh so it's it's very similar um but this film midnight special is actually jeff nichols first studio production um and it's sort of bizarre to have like the warner brothers try like not trying to like throw Nichols into like some big Marvel movie or like you yeah, know they they, about that before. That's usually the they like to take indie, one or two indie right. sci-fi and then like all right pluck right. him into yeah. something bigger. Um, but it's cool that they're letting him do this. Uh, I feel like they're aware that he's more of like a Christopher Nolan type who did a lot of like smaller films before he went into like that Batman trilogy, mm-hmm. which uh, you know it, it's definitely great to see Nichols sort of honing his craft in sort of like the farm league kind of before (laughs) yeah um yeah i'm getting better and better because i don't like after watching a film like this and um like portion of mud and like take shelter i i don't really want him to do bigger things because you think he's got enough ideas where i mean he wrote and directed this Uh, he's obviously knows what he's doing right um, oh, and uh, Nichols, the the film that I was talking about, Loving, uh, that's in going to be in Cannes 2016, that also is slated for a 2016 release. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, like the, the Nichols camp is really pumping them out. I feel like we'll end up just reviewing that too. Um, so yeah. Um, I read that he wrote the film as a reflection on becoming a father, mm-hmm. which just makes me wonder what... <laughs> what his kid is like <laughs> yeah <laughs> must have beautiful eyes yeah. oh god no <laughs> being a father is really fucking hard there's a cold after me uh but it stars uh michael shannon obviously uh joel edgerton kirsten dunst Jaden Lieberhar as the uh alton the character we're just talking about the boy paul sparks from boardwalk empire which uh interestingly Michael Shannon and Paul Sparks have starred in eight films together. Is that true? Wow. Oh, that's <laughs> a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've seen Paul Sparks in anything besides this. And but I was a big Boardwalk, Boardwalk fan. Empire, and then he was in House of Cards recently, too. Ah, okay. Uh, and then we also have Kylo Ren. <laughs> yes, and Probably Kylo. Yeah. Star Wars. Which, uh, another fact I read was that he found out that he got the, the role as Kylo Ren while they were in the middle of filming this while he was on set. Really? Yeah. Okay, so that's maybe why this other film, Loving... I, I feel like this film was in post for a really long time mm-hmm. because, I don't know. I, I just can't think of any other reason that yeah. Oh, yeah, two yes. films would be yeah. like coming he, out the same yeah. year. If he had to like and still we, go do all of Star Wars and then Star Wars came out. And right, still yeah. Didn't come out. That long ago that they were like, <clears throat> hey, yeah, Adam, you're getting this. Wow. Yeah, because that would have been... Star Wars was in production for probably at least like two years, you would think. So this was filmed a while ago. Yeah. I think. That's weird. That's real weird. Um, so I don't know, maybe we can start setting up the plot for this very, very unique plot. Can, can I say, uh, before we do the plot? Yes, of course. I like uh, the title of this movie a lot. Right. Because it just sounds like a movie title. <laughs> it's it like it's like it's like Blade Runner or like Pineapple Express where like right. it, it doesn't tell you anything about the movie really. Mm-hmm. And then uh and then like having seen the movie now I still have no idea like what it means. It seems yeah, it's like it's just kind of like something to put on a poster. It is what it is, yeah. Um mm-hmm. which I enjoy. Like I don't know why. I just like I like when they do that kind of stuff. Yeah. It does kind of have that like B movie, like kind of campy, almost comic booky, like feel to it. Calling the movie that, like, and then some of like the we'll talk about it later after we set up the plot. But just some of the visual elements in the movie are very like comic booky, almost in a way. I was reading online. I don't. I don't cut in again. But uh, the midnight special title derives from a southern traditional folk song that describes. Uh, you know, midnight special as a passenger train or something like that would run in the south. Okay. And uh, in the folk song, they would describe it. It would be like midnight train, something ever loving light. And I feel like that kind of ties into like them in the car. And like, I love like that opening sort of scene before the title card midnight uh, special where, um, 
you know, because mid- midnight special, uh, like that ever loving light could be like those headlights kind of on the road. But like even when he turns them off and he puts like the night vision goggles on, I'm like, oh, yeah. And then like midnight <laughs> special pops up. I really love that. But like even when he turns the headlights off, it could kind of be like the kind of ever loving light is like a father's love or paternal instinct kind of. Mm-hmm that's the farthest stretch I feel like I've had on this <laughs> podcast of trying to be like, there's poetry in this title, but, uh, um, I, I, I can go with that. Right. Yeah. I feel like you can, you can explain anything by being like, Oh, it's from a song. Right. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and people just kind of back off, you know? Oh yeah. They're like, Oh, okay. It's deep. It's deep. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great sci-fi. It's, it is a great, like sci-fi title though. Yeah. yeah I don't know. Um, but yeah, Let's talk about the plot. The plot. <laughs> the plot. Um, so I, I kind of tried to write it out so we don't take forever because it is kind of a weird it's all a, over the place plot. Um, right. With the help of an old friend named Lucas, former commune member Roy has kidnapped his biological son Alton from his adoptive father and commune leader Calvin Meyer, who has interpreted Alton's strange ability to intercept and rebroadcast various communication frequencies through his own body as messages from God which he has been using as his basis for commune servants over the past few years. That's one sentence. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, Roy and Lucas have a plan to grab Alton's mother, Sarah, and bring the boy to an undisclosed location by a specific date on which they believe a significant celestial event will occur. Um, and then when NSA agent Paul Sevier, or Sevier discovers that excerpts from these sermons contain code words only found in classified and encrypted government communications, he becomes determined to locate the boy as well. Um, so it's basically, yeah, like the IMB description said as well, these three people on the run from the FBI, the NSA, and the cult commune leaders. Right. Where do we go from here? <laughs> Where do we go from here? I um, I really did like, yeah, that, that whole, the setup of the opening scene. I feel like the, the film started out really strong. It did. Visually and just everything that's going on. Um, the whole... You know the kids sitting underneath. He's they're in the hotel room. They've got all the cardboard on the windows. Everything's blacked out. They've even got like duct tape over like the uh, peephole. The peephole. Uh, Alton is underneath a sheet, and he's got these blue like sw- speedo swimming goggles over his eyes. Mm-hmm. So the first time we see him, his father pulls the sheet over his head, and I think he's even got the. Does he have the headphones on at that point? Yeah, I think he does. Yeah. yeah. The soundproof um, headphones. His father says, are you ready? And they, they end up getting in the car. And they're actually watching right away. We find out that the, there's a man hunt out for them. Because people have found out that he's kidnapped his own son. Even before the video starts, there's audio. Which I didn't like at first. Of like a, It starts in with two commercials. Like some, something about like a car dealership and something else. And then uh, it's... Which I was like, eh, this is kind of tacky. And then it started in with... Uh, the Amber Alert report, mm-hmm. uh, which I, I kind of came to like more as the film was explained and the news played a large part in uh, this sort of on the run sort of yeah. plot. But yeah, I really just like that aesthetic of like, you know, fucking throwing guns in like a duffel bag and right. getting into this like muscle car mm-hmm. and then, you know, listening for like the police shit on the radio, Dan right. turning the headlights off. He. He's driving with night go- vision goggles instead. Like, that's what I mean by that, like, kind of, like, B-movie. like That got me like, amped. Right. Comic book. Yeah, like, it was just unique, and it was like, oh, this is like, <laughs> like, they're just gonna go bash skulls in or something. And a really cool start to it. Um, and then they end up getting in a, a car accident with a, uh, just another car, and then a, a state trooper responds. And shit gets kind of crazy from there. Um. I'm kind of lost with this plot. This this plot was kind of all over the place. It's it's a difficult plot. <laughs> well, they introduced the cult, right? They do, and that's um, the, even before I think before the title card of Midnight Special, they introduce the cult. The right? cult the cult excited me a lot. I like it cults. Did. Same. Um, mm-hmm. And the, you know they they have like this weird like like sort of fundamentalist Mormon vibe where they're all yes, or mm-hmm. like the Amish where like the women are in these like weird and act chronistic dresses and they have like the crazy braided hair mm-hmm. and they're all just like sitting in this uh like uh, multi-purpose room mm-hmm. listening to uh you know they're they're presumably sort of creepy charlatan uh, <laughs> yeah, leader yeah. but but uh-huh. the, the sort of i guess the interesting 
turn from that kind of familiar cult atmosphere Mm -hmm. is that when he like starts his sermon it's just numbers and then they all start repeating the numbers back to him Mm -hmm. um which is interesting because you like like i think we're, we're all very used to sort of the the old testament sort of like biblical fire and brimstone type stuff titles the sermons with like dates and they're like recent dates because it's coming from yeah stuff that all is like so he says like oh like march 8th like 2000 something and right from there you're like what like right what kind of sermons is he talking about? yeah it was it was good at um like sort of you know locating you in, in kind of a familiar place but it immediately like then like dislocates you from from the um sort of the trope that you're that you're expecting with the uh you know this sort of odd uh you know technological mathematical um you know twist to the uh to to whatever this sort of cult is a, is about it is and it is, it is weird cuz yeah you do think it's going to be almost i mean i i don't know if, whether i thought it was going to be some sort of christian church at first when it's first opening up but when he starts reading the numbers and the most the more recent well, dates cuz they they do believe that it's messages from god that are coming through right Alton. Um, well, I mean, do they do they have some sort of Christianity faith? Do they ever go into that at any point in the film? Yeah, because when the so the, in the scene where they're establishing the cult, he's the uh, Calvin Meyer is giving his sermon, and then the FBI conducts their raid. Uh huh. And then they're kind of interviewing uh, Calvin or interrogating him rather, and they start reading him some of the code words that they found from his sermons. He's like, "Oh, do you recognize these?" And he's like, "Yeah, I, I wrote them. They're or." You know, for my sermons and it's the word of god he says okay so yeah that's they're interpreting because the, the alton thing that's but this like, word that's, of that's god they, mean... were, they were a commune before alton oh okay came there that mm-hmm. it was just a very christian type commune and then mm-hmm. alton comes and they interpret his weird yeah frequency I, spent, thing as... I spent a lot of time thinking about that backstory which the film never goes into because you do sort of assume like like this is just your average you know texas cult there's probably one every other county or whatever. Right, yeah. But this one, for whatever reason, this kid is like kind of born into the community. And I would imagine that once he was there, that really changed like sort of the trajectory well, of they whatever said it they to believe do, in. They said that that's why they hold the sermons at night. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Found yeah. out about the, his weird light aversion is that they started holding the sermons at night. There was, uh, yeah, no, there, I mean, there was like almost just enough, but like almost a lack of exposition for me. That was where one I, of my biggest complaints of the movies that all around there's really no exposition for any of the characters or Yeah, really you anything. know, it's funny because um, when this new Star Wars movie came out uh-huh. and they really held back on the exposition, I think almost in reaction to like all of the exposition that was in like the prequels. The prequels Mm-hmm. Um, because like I, it, and, and especially like with all the superhero stuff that we've had in the past, you know, like, like 15 years, like it, it seemed like we, we built ourselves to a place of ridiculous exposition <laughs> yeah. where movies became kind of like, you could just skip like the first 40 minutes of them. But now I feel like it seems like that we're now sliding back into a place of not, um, telling people enough, which generally I like, like I like filling it in, but I agree with this one. Um, that it, it almost felt like they weren't like it would have been easier to sort of sink my teeth into it if they had given me like a little more I feel like it's one thing to start the movie like in the middle like this does where you know we're already in the middle of this action of kidnapping running away trying to figure out what's going on but then they never at any point like have the characters sit down and be like well, well here's where i'm from or you know like a moment of like revelation yeah right. it was kind of a like like this movie has like far less like dialogue in it i feel like then it would have like if somebody else had been telling this story like the whole thing and like it's that's kind of a weird movie like it was because it seems like they're going for like sort of a a nostalgic like steven spielberg sort of definitely science fiction thing but it's also like but we're gonna like do it like no country for old men you know right we're gonna like like make it this weird sort of dark Neo Western of like shotguns and motel rooms. Oh, definitely. You know, the yeah. The real kind of like backstory I picked up on was um, where we kind of left off in the plot where they they have that car accident. Uh, a trooper responds to the scene, and the the Lucas character is kind of in like a a standoff with the trooper, 
and he thinks he's going to get out of it, but uh, the Roy character ends up shooting or telling him to shoot the trooper. Right. And I think Lucas the one who ends up actually shooting him. It was kind of edited weird. But either way, the trooper... it was edited weird because then he later when they're in the car, he's like, "You listen to how I do things," kind of thing. Yeah. So I, uh, after I that, that point, was... I almost thought that Michael Shannon shot the man. Yeah. I, anyway, I wasn't the, sure. The trooper ends up dying, and then. <laughs> Does he die though? I think he was like fatally wounded. I think wounded, they, I think they imply that he wouldn't die because oh, right. yeah, they the say best. officer down. Best. This right, is anyway. this movie is weird because like I don't like n- nobody dies kind of like you think yes, all these people uh-huh. are dead and then like later on They're all they'll reveal best. them not to be dead <laughs> but like because even it's like the back to the I mean I don't know how like how like times. like out of order you guys want to go but it it, it did we'll go as out of order as you want yeah. it it did seem like. I don't like the body count of this movie should be higher. Like it felt like they, right, yeah. like it felt like it was, and they like maybe like pulled back because like you know they. I guess they kind of imply that a couple like the 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 uh, the plumber that they stay with, um, who was talking about like ley lines and stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, like at first you think that Michael Shannon kills him, and right. but they cut away. And mm-hmm. then he's you, he's revealed to still be there because the cult members visit him. Right, yeah. And then you sort of assume maybe they kill him, uh-huh. but you never find out. You never see what happens to the the the, the assassins. Yeah, especially because the first I, scene is like them walking out of the hotel room with like duffel bags full of like guns. <laughs> You're like, they're gonna fuck people up. I completely <laughs> forgot about that plumber scene though, because yeah. like Michael Shannon like has a pistol and he's like, I'm sorry, kind of, and like raises it towards him. Yeah. I mean, they, they don't, you don't hear a gunshot, but they do cut away. I definitely thought right. he was dead. No, but then, then they then later on, they have two the two men that the cult sent after him talk well, to yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, he's revealed to be alive yeah. later on. Yeah, it's very bizarre. But you're right. With the trooper, they do he does say that uh, he, Roy has the excuse of, like, oh, I knew he was wearing, or yes. he was wearing a vest. And mm-hmm. uh, Lucas, I think, says, you didn't know that. Like, mm-hmm. But the for the exposition when they meet up with uh, Walton's mother Sarah Kirsten Dunst later, right. she asks Lucas what he did before this, and he says, "I was a state trooper," and kind of just like slams the door and walk off, which was effective exposition because it explains yes. like why mm-hmm. he would have to be very, very like he's literally was a state trooper had to leave his job, like steal all these guns from his job, and then get into an altercation with other state troopers, possibly kill one, mm-hmm. all for this like kid that has shown him things through his eyes, like that. It shows a lot about that character. But they didn't do that for any of the other characters, which is what I thought was really lacking. Because I really liked that. Like who? That was, who would you rather see more exposition Roy of? Roy or any of them. Like Yeah, the Michael Shannon character is like weirdly They don't explain like, like skeletal. Like Yeah. Like I guess like the kid's his son, so you sort of read into what father son relationships are like. Mm-hmm. But he yeah, he has like no backstory. He barely talks. And like I really like I like Michael Shannon, um, and like I said, I was like a, a big Boardwalk Empire fan. But I kind of feel like he's just not a great front man or not front man, uh, leading man. I get that, yeah. Like, cause yeah, he probably wouldn't lead be a leading man in anything but a Jeff Nichols film. <laughs> exactly. I don't has he been a leading man in anything but a Jeff Nichols I don't film? Think so. But like it's it's just such a weird because he can play this the strong silent guy. Or like the kind of crazy guy, mm-hmm. but in this, where you sort of need an emotional connection between, you know, the father and son to, like, you would think that would be at the heart of the movie, mm-hmm. but you have like this, this uh, sort of weird, uh, dispassionate child, and also this weird dispassionate man, and it's kind of hard to like, like, look at them and be like, oh, that reminds me of me and my father. Right, well, yeah. Me and yeah. my son. Uh, this mm-hmm. is my other biggest complaint with the movie is that they, they don't really explain... Again, like, this is where exposition would have really, really helped is, like, he used to be in the commune. We, we kind of get that. We don't really understand, did he leave before? Why is Alton, like, adopted by the commune? I think the... the... Kirsten Dunst character does say that when she's talking about Michael Shannon's character, she said, uh, like, I didn't have the heart to, but he stuck around and watched a man who wasn't his father raise our son for two years. Right, but, like, what? why did he stick around? or Why did he give him up for adoption? Give him, right, I, I, I can imagine I he was stuff. forced into it because the cult 
took that very seriously well, with this. Right, but then there's also like the, so the, the entire time the whole plot is them going to this undisclosed location mm-hmm. to do this undisclosed thing and then they never really disclose why they were going there in the first place like what cause they, they believe something's going to happen but they never really get into that and it's supposed to be something that's important because they keep saying because Lucas like who's just like kind of caught up with all them keeps saying like oh like the, the kid needs to go to the hospital like he doesn't look well right and Roy keeps saying, you know, oh, this is bigger than that. Like, it's more important than that. Like, putting this whatever mission that they're on in front of his actual child's health. But they never explain what exactly they believe is going to happen. Like, obviously, it's supposed to be some kind of, like, cataclysmic yeah. end times type thing. Yeah, I would almost rather, like, the movie of finding out the kid is weird and then giving the kid up for adoption and then escaping from the cult, like, yeah. all before this, I would would... I think interests me more than like this actual story, which is kind of just like, you know, a, a road trip chase kind of movie, <laughs> yeah. but they don't cause they're like, yeah, everything you said, like those are interesting emotional conflicts that they just kind of don't play out. Um, right. And it's like, if we had seen like his, you know, real passion for his son as like a family member and, and you know, everything like that would make his devotion to this, weird thing that were never really explained seem all that more great but we kind of just never get to see him actually really relating or loving his son or even if just it, kind of this disconnected relationship the entire time even if they had done like kind of like an abraham and isaac thing where michael shannon is still like a devout member of this cult but feels like he needs to sort of do something with his own son right in sort yeah. of a sacrificial way and that was the other thing i didn't understand is that his their we do come to understand that whatever they're trying to do does come from Alton's like frequency sermon type thing. Mm-hmm. But it's like, why did you have to separate from the cult from that? Because they believe the sermons too. It was mm-hmm. just like, they found, they said something about reading, putting numbers together, cracking some kind of code, some kind of shit like that, right. that the rest of the commune hadn't found out, but they never really go into like, well, why wouldn't you just tell the commune that? Because we again, we never find out what they're going yeah. to this and place. Yeah, it's for. like, and you can write your own backstory. Like, right. there's definitely stuff there, but it is weird that they didn't like, like they, go there themselves. I would have liked them just like explain like if they were you know abusing Alton or like using Alton for something. Mm-hmm. But they also seem to be yeah, you know, that's weird too. Because that Alton cult, well. that's like definitely a cult where like weird shit's going on, yeah. but none of it's in the movie. Yeah, they don't like, that's a cult mm-hmm. with like sister wives and like 12 year olds getting married <laughs> and like, you know, just people locked up in bars. It's a cult that we all want to be a part of. But they're all like, <laughs> they're all just like, like well behaved, you know, the FBI shows up, they get on the bus, they go to the school, right. they answer Very the Very cooperative. They're yeah. so, they're so, it's like, you're, you're fucking dressed like it's 1840, like you're a weirdo and they're totally... Totally. Yeah, just, the only weird thing is that they it. happen to have like guns and they sent their goons out. Yeah, that, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. clearly <laughs> the goons. I liked that one goon, the the older, fatter goon, who has like he was kind of like a, yeah. not he's, a traditionally handsome the, actor. The main I don't goon. Know if that's like is he the one? He's the guy who like he's like sometimes you know you have to destiny calls you but you might not be ready for it all right whatever, yeah he, you know? he was like the main goon like yeah he, he was the main car- yeah right. yeah main i liked him yeah, and yeah. He, i liked he, him he kind of disappeared i feel like i don't know i'm curious as how much this script like changed over the course of like making this movie um but he was kind of like interesting i liked that uh i like when when movies have kind of like weirder normal looking people in them definitely and uh, uh the main goon and the uh the the plumber that they stay with are both kind of just like really interestingly strange yeah those like um, character actor looking dude so i hadn't i hadn't seen either of them before i don't know if they're like they seem semi-recognizable but i can't pick out what i've seen them before i I know i've seen them in something the one guy looks like he's from harry potter but i know he's not the actor (laughs) but he looks like the one who plays peter Pettigrew. i think yeah (laughs) and i feel like that's like a great pattern in nichols uh sort of directing uh, like the past four films that he's done in all of his films, I feel like uh, he's been really great at capturing that sort of like rural American setting. And I think I said this before, but he also has a gift for like braiding the sort of mystic atmosphere and the everyday life together. Mm-hmm. So it seems like very natural. 
and braiding the hair of female cult members. <laughs> right, yeah, the, having a very long braid. Dude, I hadn't but... seen I hadn't seen Kirsten Dunst in anything oh, for like wild. a long time. Yeah. I feel like like mm-hmm. the Spider Man movies, mm-hmm. and like I don't I never particularly liked her, and I think that her character in this was like really um, underwritten. But I did. I don't know. I enjoyed her. Like she looks kind of older. She was kind of almost unrecognizable. Yeah, like she wasn't really made up because she's dressed like the cult members. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. She seemed like far more human than the the Kirsten Dunsts of a uh, of movies past. Right. Definitely. In my, in, uh, in my opinion, she, yeah, she was she yeah. taking a more serious turn lately. She did like Melancholia and then. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's I did right. That. Yeah. I did see that. Yeah, she's great when you give her a good meat to work with. <laughs> <laughs> I, just looked out. I don't know but yeah i mean again he does after watching take shelter he does the same thing in take shelter as well in like i said before take shelter also has themes of michael shannon trying to protect his family at all cost even from like sort of mystic elements he doesn't really like understand mm-hmm. uh so yeah it's it, it felt very similar to take shelter um, I don't know. And I, I really like the way he paced this film too. It felt like 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 it was urgent but measured kind of. Yeah. It was very watchable. Like yeah, I, did, it I was, was not bored by it. Mm-hmm. Although I I did feel like at a certain point, um, like I kind of knew where it was going. Yeah. And I was like 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 setting like being prepared to be disappointed that there wouldn't be like any more turns or anything, <laughs> yeah. but even so, like I still wouldn't have walked out. Like I'm, I'm like probably never gonna watch it again. But like I, I was, yeah. I was fine with it while I was watching it, and it did. Like it looked good. Like you can tell that that um that Nichols is like sort of a, you know, a a, a talented filmmaker, and it was you know it was cast well and and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I don't know. Like it, I felt like there was sort of, like. It it needed, well, it probably needed a lot of things, but I, it it seemed like the, a, an extra, like reveal at the end, or like um, a couple more turns, like in the in the third act would have um, would have made it a little harder to sort of predict where where we where were gonna end going. up. Yeah, I felt like I was left with like more questions than I like started out with, like. Hmm. Just, I, mean, I don't know if we want to get into that now, but the whole reveal at the end. Yeah, I'll get into it now, yeah. We can always go, it's, this is sort of, I feel like sometimes our discussions are a little more non-linear. Uh, uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm willing to get into it, because I have, yeah, I have a few things too. Um, so, the, yeah, the kid, Alton, um, he's got this kind of like aversion to light, like, that's why he wears the, the swimmer's goggles. Um, right. And he, he's nocturnal, so if he's awake during the day... There's a scene where they're at the the plumber's house, um, and like the the whole like room starts shaking because he's like awake during the day, and like there's like an earthquake going on. You know what was cool about that? That felt molesty in a way. The it plumber did. in him, <laughs> yeah. Like they woke up and he, like the it's yeah. Like, what are you doing, man? Yeah, what, can't just. What, what, what are you doing with the kids' they, room? They never answered that. I that I wish they would have, or at least like hinted at. Like the only hint they really gave is that it was. They kept saying it was comforting, but. Because they, they do this weird thing where Elton will like. Earl Does he want to share that vision? Can you force him into it, kind of thing? <laughs> like, like is, he, can you do it against his will? Eyes, yeah. And there's like this beam of light that goes into their head or whatever. Like That's a, whatever he mm-hmm. showed Lucas to convince Lucas to come along with them. And then mm-hmm. he shows this uh, older guy, the plumber. And I guess he had showed him before because his excuse when like Michael Shannon like beats him over the head with a lamp and like approaches him later is like, you know, I had to see it again. Right, and mm-hmm. then uh, I think some of the when the Adam Driver or Kylo Ren is uh, interviewing some of the people from the commune, they say they describe it as being like comforting. Or, yeah. but they don't, no one goes into like what you see in there. I feel like I needed to see what at least a glimpse of that because if you have like this guy Lucas, who he, he admits like he hasn't even talked to Roy in like ten to fifteen years. Well, I didn't mind that to... because, like, I I kind of liked the des- like the descriptions that they gave. Like, it was a prism of like, like light or something, and like I kind of got the understanding that it was otherworldly, and like it was. I, I didn't really right, need to I, see yeah. what was but going on. Like yeah. You have to like explain either that or you have to explain what they're going to do, like what they believe is going to happen at this cataclysmic event, because otherwise we have no understanding of why Lucas would come along 
Like, if you haven't talked to someone in 15 years, well, and Roy knocks on your door with a kid that he's kidnapped while you're a state trooper and says, we're going to blah, 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 such and such place to do such and such thing. Here, look into this kid's eyes. Well, You'll no, understand. no, but I, I mean, I think when you're approached with something that's otherworldly, I think you get a, a response that's sort of... Um, I don't... He... But like like like, like a response that like sort of audience right. like we were never keyed mm-hmm. in and there wasn't like there was a reason that they didn't show us. I don't know. I, I kind of like liked... it was just like it just wasn't there. I feel like... like Lucas didn't even really need to be in the movie. Like they kind of set up like there was going to be this um, conflict between him and Roy like later mm-hmm. down, and then it never really happens. Like they it were was... mostly okay the whole time. It was they like were after mostly the in the same place the whole time. I feel like yeah. cool for them having like the police scanner and the guns. And stuff like that being a being, being able to being escape law, like, an know, amber alert essentially knowledge. maybe although uh roy could have just been a cop like uh nicholas cage in the wicker man you know <laughs> yes uh-huh. yeah cops can be involved in in cults and stuff right yeah but um you know what i thought was really cool in that scene where um the plumber went into the like locked eyes with uh with the kid was and the the whole earthquake's going and one of the walls of the room like cracks and like separates from the roof yes but uh-huh. it doesn't fall over it just kind of sits there mm-hmm. and i feel like that's such like you were talking about Nichols being like a a chronicler of like you know rustic country folk right like yeah. i feel like like michael bay would have like just yeah. exploded the, the whole house <laughs> Blew the walls out but yeah. this guy knows that like you know if there's you know sometimes if uh if there's an earthquake in a shitty house like a wall will just like you know go like this and let some light in but it was just i don't know it just felt much more like i think they tried to make everything as sort of within the realm Mm -hmm. of reality like Mm -hmm. as far as the the science fictiony stuff like when the 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 satellite like crashes into the gas station Mm -hmm. or even the sort of you know uh, alien landscape that you see at the end it all seemed like very restrained compared to you know, I'd like in this age of superhero movies when um, everything is just a little like too CGI, you know, like everything right. in this felt like kind of like, you know, maybe that maybe, you know, that is how it would have looked or, or whatever. Right. And I think um, I, I haven't talked about it a lot, but I, I feel like there's um, I don't even know how to explain it, but I feel like the director wants to transport us to this sort of you know childlike wonder with a, a lot of the thematically with, with the film and everything and what's going on with the kid and uh and i feel like he almost gets there and like after like almost what like two hours of uh, slow and suspenseful build-up the movie arrives at the climax um and at first it sort of casts that sort of like undeniable spell but, uh, you know, somehow I feel like that stopped short. Like, the imagery sort of stopped short of, like, inspiring, like, awe. Like, as, as much as the characters do. Yeah, yeah, like, the final reveal. Like, yeah, I where, I well. feel, where I feel like Nicholas usually, or Nichols, <laughs> Nicholas, uh, he usually excels at showing rather than telling. He does that very well in uh, Take Shelter, mm-hmm. just because it's forces of nature and it's a locust being like swept in like the wind and i feel like that was like one of the they show that a lot in the trailer and like in the poster yeah. is just like the formations of locusts like up in like the sky and everything uh, in like a tornado or something uh but i feel like this is an instance where maybe he showed us too much kind of like he spent too long on that kind of like. Well, it's like I mean, you can show that, but like I feel. You like mean you just have... the scene itself was too long? I you have to explain something. Like we should have seen it, and then the movie would end I... like ninety seconds later. In... Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I kind of felt like. I I don't know. Me maybe I thought like what? we we never saw like what it was when he would look at somebody and he would share his like light prism. Yeah. Why would we see the end result? Kind of. I think that it. it it could have been handled better in two ways like okay. either either or in one like i think they could have done it where we didn't really see anything supernatural right. until the very end and we just had to sort of like we we could see cuz a couple of times um we see people sort of becoming convinced of this kid's power definitely um like with uh with uh 
uh, Adam Driver, you know, like right, we see yeah. that he's about to see it and then it cuts away and then mm-hmm. he's convinced. If they had done more of that and like maybe not had like so many like eye light like freakouts, you know, and sort yeah. of saved the truly fantastic stuff for just the very end and then split and it, you know to the point where like you're sort of wondering all throughout if this is just sort of in these people's heads because they are sort of involved in a cult like they're sort of like susceptible to this um, yeah, impressionable people and them. and so like maybe you don't it is kind of like it is it a, is it just a kid or is this the kid with right. special and then then at the end i think that would have been more of a reveal mm-hmm. or to just have because the because they are going for like a very sort of um sort of uh fragile beauty with that kind of landscape at the end right. if they had contrasted that more like if they really had cuz i think the movie sort of wanted to be darker than it was and uh-huh. they ended up being like with a, a half step into darkness but not really right, like yeah. fully but if they had like if it really had been all at night instead of cuz they kind of switched into the day like mm-hmm. halfway through and if they really had been killing people and if things really had just been shitty the whole time mm-hmm. and just sort of portraying like this 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 world with this um you know Cormac McCarthy you know nihilistic view of of the the modern south um and then contrasting that to these beautiful sort of utopian structures i think that also might have yeah had more I of can a, see that. like an emotional um contrast to what 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 had you know been shown before yeah and i think that was my thing too is like it, i don't think they had done enough beforehand to really warrant this kind of scene this big like reveal and then the, right. whatever happens in the reveal is not visually just on a plain visual level it's not that cool looking it wasn't that, that was and my they, problem yeah and again if, maybe if they just had like a 30 second scene of that and that's it like maybe the movie ends right there there might be a different but they like they really drag it out for like two or three minutes of just like showing all these like scenes maybe that's why it took so long for this movie to get made is just right editing this scene but they don't look that cool they're not visually like that inventive mm-hmm. and then they don't explain any of it so it's like it's just kind of a weird looking visual scene that's not really explained or warranted and we're just kind of left with like okay that's right. what happened in the film and that's that's here so deal with it well it's also weird because from like you sort of see that bubble across like spreading seemingly yeah. across all of the deep south and right. florida yeah. and you see like the oil workers like see some of these buildings like that seems like that would be you know just a uh, a history shattering moment in in you know america or the just, world yeah, yeah like, like yeah. how is how are they still taking the time to like interrogate like people afterwards after this? yeah it's yeah. like everything is different the government uh-huh. doesn't exist like right this yeah is, yeah we just learned that there's you know what the fuck is that right but they're still gonna like put you know michael shadden in jail for kidnapping or whatever also what was what was i i didn't i didn't even look it up and i think i just did not understand what what was Michael Shannon doing in the last scene. What were those wires on his face and everything? Yeah. Oh yeah, I don't know. I don't what think. Was... I mean, at that point, I was already <laughs> I was resigned to the fact that the film was just not going to explain. Like I knew that was going to be like the last scene when it started. Like was that like I almost thought that was like some sort of like electric chair kind of setup at like first. Weird, like he has like a flash in his eyes, and I, well, yeah, he, he has. Is was there like a flash in his eyes? There, there was like, a flash like, somewhere. Like a yeah, yeah, Nolan, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, fuck that, like, man. Yeah. That's stupid. Well, he is. I mean, the wires. The that, wires so. are the same things that they put on the kid when the government had him, like the oh, red okay. and blue. Uh-huh. So I think maybe because the kid's gone and he's like their the the relative that they have in captivity, they just so, like throw yeah. it on there just to yeah, like see if anything happens. But again, that's like just you know reading into it. It's weird instead though instead of them just telling you. He's in like a hallway between like a bunch of a, a bunch of jail cells. He has two shackles on his wrist and that are fucking nailed to the floor, and then he has just wires attached to his head that don't that seemingly don't seem to be like plugged into any. It was I'm, just like I'm a not, bizarre I have scene. An interpretation of that, uh-huh. or not necessarily that scene, but just because I, my biggest question after I came out and I had to think about it a while was like, how did that kid become another race or like a, another species, like? 
was that Immaculate Conception or yeah? That's another yeah, whole that thing. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that is another <laughs> whole <laughs> question. I mean, that's, <laughs> the conclusion I ended up coming to is that it, it had to be some kind of like evolution of man and like these people that are living why they're still living on earth the, the light people that's i guess you know us if we evolve in like a couple hundred years yeah or something maybe. Or, or it's yeah, that, just maybe the, the kid evolves and then somehow just, the, the dad is going I, I just about to didn't, know, again and I didn't even think about that i didn't know why they would I, but they didn't plant that was, i, I that thought me the, like having to come up with that on my own they see, didn't plant enough of that i thought the flash in his eyes was kind of like See, one of the, I feel like the, one of the most telling parts of Michael Shannon's character was, and I think this is one of my favorite lines of the film, is, I, I meant to write this down, but I didn't write this down, and, I, and uh, the son, uh, near the end, when he's like, you, I want to be out in the daylight, and he's kind of like almost taking control of this like relationship between him and his father, he's becoming like the dominant person, mm-hmm. and he says, you don't have to worry about me anymore. And like he kind of like looks, and Michael Shannon kind of looks at him, and he's like, "Well, I like to worry about you. Yeah. Like, it, like it's kind of like my job, it's my duty, kind of thing." He's like, "I like to do this." Oh, so and, that's what the movie's about then is like, you know, being an empty nester, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. like having your kid. Just you know, I'm gonna go hang out with my friend's dad. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think you guys that don't want sandwiches down there? <laughs> the, the, the flash. I can make the pizza. <laughs> the flash in his eyes though i think is like maybe his son reassuring him that he's okay is that's kind of what i took away from him i mean that's just as valid I think, as any other it's, it's definitely, but, cause, cause I he's definitely it. having a moment i think with because he's looking at what the sky or yeah, something he's, he's right? looking he's looking through one of those jail cells in the hallway and looking out into the outside world and obviously this kid or the other world has control that's in a, like another hemisphere kind of thing yeah. uh, that's invisible to our eye, I guess. Um, you know, a flash of light, I think, is the most... That has to be coming from his son, I think. I don't know. And I think like he can be like, I can be at peace now. I didn't like really interrogate... Like Once it was like aliens, or if they're not aliens, they're like sort of the alien archetype you know Mm -hmm. like space people right once like it was revealed to be that i was kind of like i checked out a little bit right you know it's just like i I would not that that's like i mean that is kind of derivative but like i was just really hoping that it would be something slightly more interesting um but now that i think about it yeah like what like like why would like how important is that kid that they would expose their whole existence after millennia right yeah just to like pick up that just let like fuck that kid like you know why is that you know yeah i don't it seems like they really went out of their way to like get that kid back or that's for the first time or whatever although i mean i guess you could kind of because it the kid was picking up any kind of frequency so it could have just been he was picking up their communications and they were planning that kind of reveal for some other purpose. Oh, that's a good point. Because they were they did want to be there on that yeah. specific day because of the communications. Like that mm-hmm. was their like uh So he could have just picked up on that. But the kid was obviously supposed to be part of that race and somehow too. So Right. I, I just, don't know if that's necessarily I just kind of felt like the whole thing was sort of just like a long X Files episode, you know? <laughs> like it from did. the not from the, the cops perspective, like from the perspective of the the monster of the week, you know? Yeah. But, right. um, it's just like, and like, cause it's not like, it's not a bad movie. Like I think it was, it's like well made and everything, mm-hmm. but it just didn't really like, I don't know. I just kind of like wondered why a lot, like what, like what is the, they didn't like, it's one thing if you don't answer something for some like aesthetic reason or to be intentionally vague, but I yeah, like I couldn't, what is I couldn't, learned I couldn't, by I, not. I couldn't come up with any answer for why we didn't get answers for a lot of these questions. Like, it didn't seem like it benefited the film in any way. It was like maybe he just didn't come up with answers for this stuff and thought that it would seem more deep if it was just left like vague and up to interpretation. Well, I, it does seem like like you were saying he is like a shower and not a not a teller. And I think if he had had answers, sure, sure not a grower. grower. Yeah. <laughs> if he had had answers for all these things, they probably wouldn't have been very like good answers. You right. Know? Like yeah. I don't really see a great version of this movie ever. Yeah. Existing, but um, it is sort of yeah. It is weird like how little 
is well. I feel like if you maybe don't show all that shit at the end, like then that's more of an intentionally vague. Well, yeah. See, that's that. That's what my complaint was. Because then then it's like, oh well, nobody knows. But it's kind of like some of the people sort of started to understand, and then there's stuff that they knew that we just didn't know as an audience, right? To no benefit, like. And I don't know. It it, it was. I wanted it to be more of like a a sci-fi film. Where I mean, like you, you do kind of think he's like an alien for a while. I wanted it to be more of a sci-fi film where like UFOs take the back seat to sort of like human emotions or like you know like uh, identifiable uh, human emotions, yeah. kind of like like him becoming a father, like uh, the director uh, Nichols or whatever. Um, and the end sort of robs you of that. It kind of like takes you like oh like there's some deeper meaning to like I I don't know. It kind of robbed me of like the exposition that well, it's also because, I didn't like, the, the, think the, that had to be there until basically the very end. The you know his mom, his dad, and Lucas they didn't know that this whole like alien race or whatever race was like a thing. They had some other reason for wanting to go. That's I really, really wish he would have just given us some hint about what they thought was going on there. Right, it was so important that they were willing to give up their son like, at this celestial event that they thought was going to happen. Mm-hmm. So what did they think was going to happen? I mean, I, I, I can assume it had something to do with God, but then, like, just say that. Like, just give us some reason for why parents would be willing to give up their kid at this cataclysmic event that they're, you know, willing to shoot police officers and kidnap and travel across state lines and whatnot. Like, they didn't know that there was going to be some, like, alien race that was going to take them away. They just knew that they well, did they or didn't they? Because, like, I assume when he showed people things, I think he... I feel like he showed things, like, from but his... He had, he had to tell them that he thought he might belong to, like, another race. Right. He has that one scene where he has that really weird line where he's like, sit down, Lucas. <laughs> yeah, that was like, a weird scene, like yeah. I did not like the <laughs> but then, But then even in that scene, he doesn't, like, <laughs> he doesn't fully explain... Like, he talks really vaguely, and I'm like, well, how would these people even, like these people would have questions within the realms of that scene as well. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I hate... I mean, I'm not a huge fan of, like, children and things, but, like, (laughs) just generally, because I think... Michael Diggler hates kids. Like, I I like them in real life, but not in in narrative. Because, like, I feel like we're all like, oh, what's the the little brilliant kid have to say? And, like, this kid... Because he's not, like... He's not, like, very likable because he doesn't really do kid things. (laughs) But, like... But he's also like he just he's filled with all this this like otherworldly wisdom, which I just find so like tedious and like like um yeah, like like cause it, it makes it cause it's so unrealistic, like that's not the relationship that parents have with their children. Mm-hmm. But it's also like 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 I feel like part of the reason he's difficult he doesn't give them the, the information is because he is a child and like he doesn't communicate like an adult who would just like tell them all the stuff but like that's like a a uh, a a an unnecessary obstacle that they built into the plot by having it like i feel like they lean too hard on just him being a kid and that's like that's why they have to protect him and like he can't protect yeah. himself and like he he doesn't really know what's going on and um and uh yeah, his character's weird because he's like uh, he's reading comic books and like he has to be like carried at moments but then whenever he talks he's like sit down Lucas and he's got this very like mature like affectation to the way he talks and right. but then sometimes he'll have like weirder lines that are a little more kiddish I feel like he was just kind of really not very well written for being the most like important part of the movie mm-hmm. it was kind of just all over the place I don't know there was something about <sighs> I don't even know how to explain it. It was just... I don't know. Come back. Pass! <laughs> uh, I was about to say something and I completely... Did you guys uh, like... Failed on it. Um, did you like how serious the movie was? Like, because I feel like... Like, I'm not saying it should be like sort of, uh, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy jokey. But right, that, right. But that does seem to be more the model for contemporary blockbusters and i do think that sort of a lighter like just having jokes and like more relatable characters allows people to sort of get in to an otherwise not great movie like it just makes it a little more right yeah I tolerable i think my view is like i don't need the jokes but i i do need more of like a even like a traditional story arc like we don't really have any growth with the characters besides the yeah. father lets his kid go but again we don't 
We don't come to feel find out why he was willing to do that. We don't know anything about who he was before, because the the movie kind of starts like in media res in terms of he's already kidnapped the kid. He's already made this decision to go along with this plan, and we don't really know where anyone's coming from. Right. So where they end up at the end of the movie is kind of just oh, all right. Well, they saw something, and they believed it. You know, and it's like it, you, I just felt like the, there wasn't really there was no growth. There was no we didn't learn anything. There was nothing about the sci-fi elements that we were shown that was like explaining a greater truth about mankind. Like it yeah, wasn't like well, they were like, what, oh, yeah. well, there's this race over us and they've been, you know, this is why there's deja vu or some kind of weird thing. Like they could have done something small like that to be like, oh, that explains something about life rather than just being, oh, this exists. Yeah. Well, I guess that's Period. what, like you can be sort of literary and artsy if you are sort of sharing, like exploring some, like actual truth that's out in the world yeah but this and or if you're not doing that you can just make a popcorn movie which is also fine right but i feel like this has the the sort of um affectations of a serious movie Mm -hmm. but it never gets farther than like a very like i feel like everything is on the surface in this movie or like not said but like like i feel like there's not like a lot of stuff to um to dissect for for deeper meaning like it's i feel like everything that happens you just you understand i feel like the entire movie lives because it, it starts off so strong because we don't need to know all that stuff in the beginning and i'm completely fine not knowing that stuff mm-hmm. but then it kind of just stays at that same level the entire movie like yeah they don't you, right they don't yeah. feed us any information throughout yeah there We're aren't just really left in a lot of reveals of like the first like 30 minutes another thing i did like though that kind of uh ties in with the like the the wall breaking is, right is it when they're in the car and they drive through the roadblock uh-huh and then like uh like the front bumper falls off and then the power steering goes and uh-huh. like he's complaining about that and then lucas is like yeah it's gonna be real hard to drive when the when the tires come off mm-hmm. but like that's another thing where it's like michael bay the car would just be fine it right would yeah, explode yeah. Mm-hmm. but like with this guy he like he, like he he's like, well, what would actually happen if you drove a car through a roadblock? Right, it would. Mm-hmm. You could probably get like maybe a mile, and then it would, you know, cease to function. So that was just like a weirdly, I don't know. It's like a, they're just like very, they're sort of. I don't know if it's like uh, like an OCD thing or just like the, um, like he's just very attuned to reality. But like, um, it's 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 things that you don't normally see in like a, I, yeah, a movie like this. I think it definitely ties into the sort of um the sort of uh how how in tune he is with the rural america and i think um it's also uh, i think a lot of the action scenes are conventional uh in a way uh, i think uh, a lot of you know it, it doesn't look pretty but he's got like the scanner there and he's got everything else and you know they do need that state trooper to get through everything else mm-hmm. and and to some extent, I can believe that. Uh, also, just to respond to everything else, um, I do. I, I really like liked this feeling that this film uh, inspires you to have for the first like three fourths, and it's it's not until the end I feel like that that's kind of spoiled almost. I, I feel like there is like this eerie feeling that you get from. Uh, sort of uh, that sort of Spielberg sort of like uh, in uh, what was it Encounters of the 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 third kind right yeah yeah close it was encounters, kind of, yeah, yeah close encounters yeah um yeah well, yeah it's like you have that curiosity about like what's going on right. the entire time and you can either like this film does sort of show you what's going on right or you can you know not show anything but have character growth and then this doesn't really have either characters don't grow they sort of show us but don't really explain anything and mm-hmm. i keep bringing it up but i was really really bugged by that <laughs> how little was explained in this movie in the end right but uh i don't know if we want to start wrapping up to some fingers show some fingers show some fingers all right no, i'll go first all right um i really wanted to like this um I think I was kind of viewing this or hoping this would be like this year's like Ex Machina where like right in that cool kind of indie sci-fi film that was underrated that we could be screaming at our TVs when it didn't get nominated for Oscars and stuff like that. Um, but in the end, I, it, 
like I've said a million times, it, it did not answer enough. It, it left you with more questions than you started out with. Mm -hmm. It really was not a satisfying ending visually and definitely not enough to warrant an ending that doesn't give you any answers. Um, that being said, the cinematography is fucking awesome throughout the movie, I thought. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of like low light shots. Um, I don't know if they actually did any day for night shots. If they did, they played it off really, really well. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, like the, the Alton character, he uh, has this aversion to light, so he's nocturnal, so they're, they're always driving at night. There's a lot of night shots, and they all look beautiful in the low light. Um, and the acting's pretty good throughout. Michael Shannon, I think, is pretty good. I think everyone except for really the kid, I really didn't think the kid was that great. <laughs> yeah. Again, you give kids a pass um, in movies like this. Um, but in the end, I don't think it's enough to really save the film. I don't think... Like you said, Michael, I don't think I would ever really want to watch this again. Right. Even with all the answers I felt like I didn't have, I don't feel like I need to go back and look for more. I'm pretty sure they're just not there. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd give it two and a half fingers. All right. Um, I'll go next. Uh, there, there's a few notes I haven't read. Uh, but I was looking through reviews for this film, and I think it's standard practice for film reviewers to hail almost any director with the title like Oh, the next Steven Spielberg. Uh, you know, after pulling off a sort of Spielberg-esque film, which I think this kind of was, you know, like J.J. after Super 8, or uh, that guy after his, uh, I think, Trevorrow or whatever his name was, after the most recent addition to the Jurassic Park franchise, the Jurassic World. Oh, uh, uh, Alan Trevorrow or something like that. Yeah. However, I feel like uh, Nichols is able to pay homage to sort of both like E.T. and like I said before, the close encounters of the third kind. Uh, yet I feel like it never really comes at the expense of his, like uh, his own uh, artistic identity. Um, even though there is a problem with uh, exposition uh, a bit in this film, I kind of also like that he doesn't, spell things out by a flashback which i know like a lot of other directors would handle this film with mm -hmm. um and it was hard to place a genre on this it is sci-fi but it's also kind of like a road trip movie in a way <laughs> <laughs> in like this like road boys. yeah this like road trip like getaway <laughs> is do. like i liked how they kept switching vehicles also. yeah i like that too in the the road trip get away whatever it was a nice device to keep furthering the plot to keep physically moving it forward mm -hmm. um and it also sort of trusts us to follow along and pick up sort of meaningful details as the past sort of bled into the present even though maybe not as much as we want um and i do like the alton sort of inspires a feeling of protectiveness uh, whether it be like sort of um, to the the like lo like loyal like how loyal Lucas was, mm -hmm. or uh, like Adam Driver, and because he was kind of just a straight laced NSA agent. Who I feel like we didn't talk about that much. Yeah, he was actually one of my favorite um, parts. And I mean, these were two like pretty like rational minded men who were just unexpectedly transformed by their encounters with Alton. I don't know, I just thought that was a nice touch. Uh, but overall, I think uh, four films into his career, Jeff Nichols seems to be incapable of really making a, a bad movie, uh, or even like an uninteresting one, I would say. Um, at a time where most indie filmmakers, you know, sort of gauge success uh by the speed of their like graduation to sort of like marvel dc not really dc but marvel um like blockbusters uh and i think this film was important to continue like sort of forging his own uh path um but again there was a lot of problems i had with the film uh i would probably give it a three and a half fingers three and a half um um, I think that, uh, this is like, uh, I think part of this is like, um, 
because Hollywood sort of works the way that it works and mm-hmm. there's kind of a limit to the types of films that you can really make if you want to become like a sort of a big director. Right. So like, I feel like, I mean, I, did, I guess you said that his previous film had like some sort of like magical realist elements to it. Yeah. But seeing this after just knowing that he'd like did like shotgun stories and mud, like this just seems like a guy making a sci-fi movie who probably shouldn't make a sci-fi movie and like, right. isn't that interested in sci-fi <laughs> movies. Cause like he's mostly interested in like weird Southerners just having very sort mm-hmm. of stoic conversations with each other. <laughs> and you could like, that's a great type of movie. Like I like movies like yeah. that, but um, it doesn't maybe work well as far as, uh, you know, trying to, to get that sort of that chasing that ET level of, uh, of wonder. Um, so I think yeah like I don't it's there's nothing like bad about this movie there's just nothing that's like really good about it mm-hmm. either. So I think I'd probably do uh two and a half fingers. That's just like straight right. half of five right. Right yeah, it's right in the middle. Um so yeah, I mean there was yeah, I th- uh uh Adam Driver has a cool voice. I feel like that might he be does. Yeah. like 80% <laughs> of his appeal. Yeah. Um but I thought, like, I was kind of, like, when I was watching, I was like, oh, Jeff Goldblum. Like, it's like a Jeff Goldblum part. Yeah, like that was part. a... Yeah. And, like, Jeff Goldblum just would have played it uh, uh, just a little funnier and more interesting, I think. Uh-huh. But, uh, but I, you know, I guess that a lot of that is just not having a lot to work with. Like, to, a couple jokes are fine, like, to just have... Like, I think, even in serious movies, it's good to have, like, a little bit of um, levity just mm-hmm. uh especially in sort of those subplot kind of uh well yeah i mean overall it's entertainment so right some kind of something to laugh at so did you uh figure out the balance because we're all terrible at math 2.8 and a lot of a lot of other numbers so that would round down to two and a half fingers two and a half overall. fingers wow Michael's overpower the Joe. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be until the Jungle Book review that the, the Joes, Joes will the, the Joes will come back. <laughs> why did you Why did you decide to round down? I was like, is that that's traditionally what we do? Yeah. yeah. Well, because if like if one of us gave, we were thinking like if I gave a film a four and a half and Joe gave it a five, right? Then it might round up to a five if a we five. round yeah. up. But it's like we didn't both give it a perfect score. That would be so the, ultimate po- the ultimate the ultimate. The ultimate pull fix score, the ultimate perfect score, I feel like, would be both, both give it five. So you're like erring be... on the side of being yeah. like less praising than more praising. Yeah. yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. That's probably a good... Yeah, we hate everything. <laughs> that's probably a good, a good call. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess it would suck if we ended up giving something a zero because we both gave it... Well, I guess they couldn't work. It would have to go down to hand fingers. Right. Well, one of us gave it a zero. We'll talk about math later. I would love... Our new podcast, Math Talk. (laughs) (laughs) Join us for Math Talk. Um, We'll plug that podcast later. Uh, But really, I think that's everything that we needed to discuss besides... I guess we'll plug our later stuff in. Uh, I'm recording out of order, so now I don't know what's next. When you're listening to this next... uh, Next week should be Hardcore Henry, so tune in for that. That's uh, that's going to be an interesting one. Wait, no, no, no. No, wait. This would be the... the Don't listen to me. <laughs> this, hold on. Let me pull this up. There's a Could, movie called Hardcore Henry? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, God. Have you not heard about this? Oh, Michael. <laughs> oh, no. It's, so this, this would be the third episode. Because it's Cinco oh, right. de Mayo. So next week is Jungle Book with Joe Mano. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Jumping Joe Mano on Jungle Book. Tune in for that. Uh, make sure you check out HowManyFingersPodcast.com. <laughs> it's a mess. It's uh, a mess. Check out MichaelDagler.com. Yeah, and, please. Uh, everything he's got going on. Tweet at him. Only if you guys want to. Though. At yeah, Michael Dagler. Is that your Twitter as well, Michael Dagler? Yep. And yeah, I'm on there. He uh, tweets about uh, the days that authors died. Yeah, it's a, li- it's a little yes. maudlin. I've kind of been, I've de- been depressing myself as of late. Uh, it's just oh, been a, it's just been a lot of suicides, and it feels sort of exploitative to keep tweeting about them. But, uh, <laughs> I've I've locked myself in until I started this in uh, to commit. I've started this. In, well, I only have to do it for a year because oh, okay. then it just restarts. Right. Yeah. Because that's how the calendar works. But <laughs> so I started it at like I think the end of July. 
Uh-huh. So I just need to, I'm over halfway there. Right. And once I get there, then I can, you know, just start uh, tweeting uh, ridiculous, <laughs> hateful, half-formed thoughts like everyone else. It's normal stuff. <laughs> so I'm excited. <laughs> That's suicide stuff. So follow Mike Gardegler for that. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming on. This was great. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. I, this is a, I, I like this podcast. It's very, uh, it's uh, it's funny. It's good. Definitely, yeah. Not, I, the, not the Joe Mano episodes, though. Yeah, I think no, he makes yeah, it a little too much about himself, but they're a little, all the other ones. <laughs> they're a little gross, a little disgusting. But I was, yeah, Mike was like, uh, he's asking me about you earlier, and I was like, yeah, like, I feel like everyone was always like in this, because I know you from this friend group with uh, you yeah. know, Sabri and Leah and Caitlin and Joe and everything. But everyone's like, oh, you'd always, you would get along with like Michael Degler or whatever. Like you guys seem to be into the same thing. And then we, we held a Friendsgiving here yeah. uh, about like two years ago. And I started talking to you and I didn't know who you were at that point, I think. And we started, t- we talked for like a really long time about like film yeah, and literature yeah. and everything. And I was like, what's your name? And you're like, oh, Michael Degler. And I was like, oh yeah, we do get along. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, yeah, shared interests. It's uh, it's weird. Yeah, we're kind of at the like opposite ends of that that circle of people. Definitely, right, yeah. So but yeah, no, yeah. this was good. This was, I'm glad we, we got to do this. Same, and I always hear you on Joe's podcast and I'm like, I gotta get him on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, no, that's very flattering. No, I, yeah, no, this yeah. was this was a lot of fun. All right, well, uh, thanks again, and uh, signing out for how many fingers the podcast. I'm Mike. I'm Joe. And he's Mike. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's, Mike. he's also Mike. Mike. Also. I wasn't sure if I was part of that. Mike yeah. squared. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you, the guests usually aren't. I don't know why we looked at you. But...